wow, I didn't get a spring break. You know that I teach a couple classes for CU. I teach a couple classes for Front Range, teach a few classes here. So I was basically just doing my thing last week, not teaching, which is kind of weird. Um, because even though I'm only really teaching one class a day, it's part of the deal. So check, it is May 3rd. Other solutionists, if you can't find anything about another solution essay, let me look here. The chances are, if it's not under assignments, I wouldn't, I'm not gonna add anything at this point, but let me look. All right. Yeah, that says for TBA, so I'm saying no. Executive decision. Uh, <laughs> And, and hey, uh, that's based upon the fact that you are all doing an awful lot already, right? Um, so why add something else to it? Uh, the food drive, all right. Let me uh, click over here on the food drive. Oh, it made me sad the other day. We got $9,000 last semester. I think we're at like, I don't know. I wanna say we're at like a couple hundred or something. Um, but I'm clicking here. There's no shame in this game because there's plenty of time. Usually we only do it with like a week uh, or two left. So social 220, oh, wait, it says $2,707. Is that from last semester two or is that from this semester? Seems kind of high for this semester. Um, well, I'll have to go check. I wanna make sure that we're not crossing links or anything like that. If that's the case though for this class, social 100, 801, 2768. No, that can't be right, 100, 002. That can't be right. All right, well, let me uh, reach out to Charlene Ohms. She's our contact at the Larimer County Food Bank. Um, but if you have not yet, uh, we're looking at at least 25 points of extra credit. If we can get like 5,000 pounds of food, $5,000, excuse me, which is 10,000 meals, then we get 25 points. That's like, like going to a test and saying, raising it one grade. So you got an 80, now you have a 90, you got an 81 on the next test. Now you have a 91, right? It's, it's a uh, grade altering. Um, it can really shift your grade at the end of the semester in a positive direction. If we get more than $5,000 between all my classes, so you are in it with other classes, then, um, then uh, we'll go more extra credit, 30 points, 35 points. Last semester, we may have gotten 35 or 40 points. Um, but that's just because people kept donating. So last semester, we did get a couple thousand dollar donations from somebody's grandma, from somebody's uncle. Remember, you can make your own donation of any kind if you're participating, but invite family members and friends. And I mean, take that link and share it on a social network. I don't know, give it to somebody who does TikTok videos that are tasteful and see if we can raise a million dollars. Cause I posted this on my TikTok and nothing happened. So I'm not sure, not sure why that is, um, but whatever, right? Okay, any other questions? What do you mean no to solution four? I mean, there will be no solution four, mark my words. All right, so I don't know. That wasn't even, that wasn't, that wasn't supposed to be anybody really. That was just, you know, that was my political, that was my political, um, Full more content assignments. Nope. So no content assignment. I mean, so so you will have to figure in how are, are those twenty or twenty five points? That's twenty or twenty five points less to worry about. Um, yes, I am the goat, uh, but that's only because I was raised in Chicago during the real goat time. We won't have a conversation about LeBron being the goat ever because the guy's two hundred and fifty pounds, and you go and he flies like ten feet back into the air. Uh, that's not. That's not. That's not hooping. Come on now. Come on now. All right. Anyway, let's get to business. So no further questions. I have a question really fast. Sorry to interrupt you. Yeah, no, you're good. Is there any way that we can donate food instead of money? Because I just have like all these cans laying around that. I'm yeah, I, I did see something the other day um, that somebody made an in-person donation, you, you know, to the Larimer County Food Bank. So if they are taking food donations from individuals because, and I don't know what their schedule is like, right? So you're going to have to check that out. Uh, if you can do that and take that there, they can give you a little receipt. Then you just take a picture of it, upload it, send me an email of it or post it on the discussion board and then we'll know. So I'm, I'm absolutely fine with in-person donations too. It all just used to be weighing. People would come to class and then students started figuring it out and students would bring like two 50 pound bags of rice. 
you know, like all the way down the social room, then all the way back up and into the cars. Uh, but that's a staple food around the world, right? So, you know, um, now we're not doing it by pounds, we're doing it by dollars. Hopefully we can get back to, um, we can get back to something in person. Uh, looking for something. All right, so, excuse me, my nose is running. Uh, all right, so nothing else. Let's pop over here then to Top Hat. All right, describe your relationship with food. So just like we ask a lot of these questions, um, a lot of the uh, challenges that we're experiencing in regards to food, food insecurity, uh, food availability, food hoarding, can we grow enough to feed the world, right? We've already talked a bit about food waste and things like that this semester. Um, but a lot of that, most of that, all of that really intersects with our behavior. So to really get a, a feel on why we waste so much food or, 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 or how many of us really do or don't know about like, like dates, freshness dates and what that really matters. And is that a hard date? Is it not? Um, you know, a lot of that comes from our understanding, our misunderstanding, our behavior, the things that we like advertise in society around food or behaviors around food. So let's look at this and, uh, and see what our relationship with food is. All right. Complicated. It's complicated. Uh, this is not a dating app. This is the question about food. So it is complicated and it is, um, healthy. So four people said comp complicated, three people, healthy, two people, unhealthy, two for love, two for yummy. All right. Necessity in my life, necessity in my life, uh, could be better, could be worse. Um, I like that. Uh, love, not beef though. Love, love it in, in parentheses, not beef though. Um, I'll, I'll keep that in mind. Uh, it's complicated, happy, love it too much, distant. I love food and meat, but realize I may need to give it up to help drive a sustainable food system. I love it. Food is my loy, loif, loif, loif L-O-I-I-F. I'm trying to read these correctly for everybody here. Random, excessive, unhealthy, abundant, almost to the point where food doesn't sound good. Uh, love, hate, difficult to process, working on being more plant-based, energy providing, balanced, could use work, stressful, food, food is a need, constant dependence on food, try my hardest to use all my food before buying more. Boy, I wish, I wish we did that here. That is the big food waste part I'm trying to get across to a 13-year-old and a 15-year-old. If a loaf of bread is unopened here and a half a loaf of bread is opened here, which one do you take the bread from? Ah, ah. I do that kind of patronizing stuff all the time with my kids. And then I ring a buzzer if they get it wrong. Eh, sorry, thanks for playing. Uh, mindful flavor, goodness, comfort. It's delicious, essential necessity. My favorite never ending satisfaction. It's comforting, life's too short to eat crappy food. Life giving, sparing, unstable, comforting, consumer, over consumed and wasted, reliant, love, hate, sometimes healthy, sometimes very, very unhealthy. Best friends, <laughs> BFFs fluctuating, limited friendship, healthier, grateful for my access to food, sustenance, healthy, difficult survival, always hungry, very complicated. All right. Wow. Absorbing, absorbing, okay. Processing, making sociological observations and connections. All right, go make some observations for us, please, if you would. Um, what do you think? I think something that's really cool about food and seems pretty apparent here is that there's not only like a human necessity for it, but like a cultural need. Like a lot of us are saying like the loif or like, oh, I love food. Like it's more than just like sustenance for a lot of people. It's like a cultural importance. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, there's like, there is sustenance, right? And then there is love it, love, hate it complicated let's sit down and talk for a while with a giant bowl of ice cream um which i just crossed the like threshold the last two years where if i eat ice cream at night it destroys me i can't sleep all night and i get hot sweats i think that's being old i used to be able to do that anytime i wanted um but some people i guess are experiencing that already if they're lactose intolerant or dairy intolerant all right um good other observations about this list keep in mind that what we eat um, I mean, somebody might say it's complicated, you know, because they have a lot of allergies or something like that, because what they can actually eat 
they have to be very careful about um you know so for some folks it's not just a choice about what they want to eat right okay make some other observations there was a lot of negative comments like stressful bad stuff like that all right, so could be our relationship with food, habit energy, could be a lack of food maybe, um, or maybe, I don't know, when I was trying to wean myself off of junk food, I would get the craziest cravings. I mean, this is like 10 years ago now. I would, it, it's bizarre. Um, but yeah, there was a lot of withdrawal and a lot of levels I didn't expect actually um, when, I, when I drastic, actually it's 15 years ago now that I, that I drastically altered my diet. Okay, other thoughts, other um, observations about this list. What do you love about food? Or why is it difficult? Yeah. Something that I noticed, I don't know, this is just like a weird observation. Over here, right. Oops, sorry. Can you hear me? Uh, yep, go ahead. Okay. So the comment that said always hungry is kind of relatable because I feel like I'm always hungry, but I'm not like starving. Do you know what I mean? Like I have food, but I'm always hungry. And I just kind of thought that was an interesting, I don't know. I was just thinking about that for a minute. Yeah. Um, right. Uh, availability of food. And, and even when we have it available all the time, maybe hunger, or maybe it's just that uh, we're eating small bits throughout the day. Um, good. And certainly not starving. You bet that the first time it came out of the mouth, actually, actually not the first time I waited till they were about seven or eight. And I think Zion said, I'm starving. And I said, go get your computer. And he got his computer. And I said, type in starving children. And he did. And I said, hit enter. And he did. And he scrolled. And I said, now, can we talk about reframing that word? Um, and of course, you know, maybe that seems a little bit harsh, but every time he has even almost said that in the last four or five years, I'm, I'm pretty hungry, dad. <laughs> like it only took one time. Um, so yeah, good. Because the available food, a lot of people use it to cope. Uh, absolutely. Just like we shop to cope, we eat to cope a lot of the time. Sorry, just my tomato keeps making a, an appearance. Pull cherry. Anything else as far as uh, our relationship with food? I feel like COVID has changed it quite a bit. I've talked to some people about that, like being home all the time. And I think someone in the comments just said, like, sometimes I eat just to eat, to try to eat at regular intervals. And I know like for me as well, like my eating schedule has been kind of thrown off a lot, like by being home and just having things be different as well as like at the beginning, not being able to go out to restaurants and stuff. So I think within the last year, just our relationship with food has probably changed a lot. Oh, our relationship with food has changed more in the last year than in any other small amount of time. And I've been teaching for about 15 years, I'm 47. So in my lifetime, but certainly while I've been teaching. Um, uh, yeah, many of us won't uh, ever experience any form of food insecurity. Absolutely. Um, and, uh, and then some of us, some of us will, and some of us have, and I have certainly throughout the course of my life. And when I first started doing the food drive 15 years ago, there were a few boxes of mac and cheese that Julie and I had to eat. And it was just a reality, you know, as I was teaching my first college class before I became independently rich, famous, and wealthy from teaching, uh, you know, if you don't deal with food insecurity, then you might not be able to conceptualize it. People are home all the time, maybe are around food more. We've and, and if we're not eating more, maybe we've just changed our relationship with food. Started cooking and baking a lot more. It became kind of a hobby. Now it's more about making the food than eating it. Cool. Um, I mean, learning how to cook and prepare food is awesome, awesome, awesome. So I think that there's some positive externalities with this too. How about, I mean, was the, and I don't know because I haven't been back home, but I'm from the Midwest. And in our town at one time, Wendy's had a super bar. That's a buffet. KFC had a buffet. The buffets in town had buffets. Is this last year? Has COVID like put the, the death blow, the, the, the sword in buffets? Or are places like Golden Corral still just 
I don't know. All right, well, um, think about that. Buffet food was available to you at the college. Was it pre-packaged or did you have to grab it yourself and then take it somewhere? Legit question, because I don't know. I'm gonna get caught again. I don't want you to get caught. Pre, okay, pre-packaged at the dining halls like takeout boxes. Okay, so, right, I mean, amount, you know, how much you take. Um, I just, yeah, just so many things. All right, great, good. Uh, so let's say that not only are we experiencing a massive shift potentially in our relationship with food as individuals, but certainly as a culture, no time in the last 15 years also um, do I remember, except for like storms, snowstorms in Colorado, where people go by like all the bread, and we've talked about that. But this last year, on several occasions, um, food has run out, certain ingredients for things, whole items themselves, of course, the great toilet paper debacle of 2020. Um, yeah, so a lot of shift in what's available even potentially. Now, of course, we're still in a very small time and space in history where we actually have access still to most things, even on the other side of the world, if, if we want it here today. Um, but a lot of that has changed. Okay, how concerned are you about to say? Let's, let me see here with uh, PowerPoint. I've got a few things for us to watch. Um, okay, I, I wanna watch this. Should we watch it first? I'm recording, I might have to pause. No, we'll watch it at the end. Um, so describe your relationship with food. All right, this one I didn't ask, uh, but let's go ahead and put it up in the background. I'll do a screen share. Okay, you are what you eat, agree or disagree. This is something that people used to say all the time. When I was growing up, I heard all the, an apple a day keeps the doctor away and you are what you eat are probably the two most, besides clean your plate or whatever, is probably the two biggest things that, I, that I've heard ever um, back in the day and regarding food. So what do you think? I didn't ask this question online. I'm asking it to you now. What do you think? You are what you eat, agree or disagree. More importantly, as we know in sociology, why or why not? I would agree. Uh, last semester I was in an honor seminar class. It was actually just called You Are What You Eat. And we looked at all the different- um, <laughs> Really? Looked at all the different, yeah. Oh, it was really awesome. cool, but- it was about uh, food as identity and culture, even religion and politics and environment. And it was just all the different lenses of food and how we really represent who we are with what we eat. All right, great. Um, yeah, culturally food, we are what we eat. Um, so much of that, everything, good. I, I love oh, that. I didn't mean to interrupt you, but that would be an awesome class. I would love to take that class. So. From many different perspectives, you are too. Sure, absolutely. Um, yeah, and it's changed, right? You are what you eat back in the 1970s was way different than how it looks in this culture. You are what you eat in 2021. Um, very, very different. Okay, good. Who else? You are what you eat. Agree or disagree? And why? I've heard an interesting way of thinking of this where it's like you are, you feel how your food makes you feel. So like if you're happy with like your availability of food and stuff, then you might be like happier and have like a more sustainable lifestyle. But like if you don't have a lot of food security or like you don't like what you're having available, then you may not be so happy. So I hadn't heard that one till like last week. Yeah, food definitely has to do physically with what we eat our mood, elevations, processes in our body. Somebody put food becomes energy and builds your new cells. So yes, um, yeah, absolutely. Um, good, good. Uh, what else? And, and I was just thinking to myself, I guess, when I was detoxing 15 years ago from fast food, I would get excited about eating it. And as I would just going the last few times, I would like go to a Burger King or something, sit down, get it, take one bite of it, and instantly feel depressed. 
Like it was weird. I, I, I maybe it was because I knew I was trying to get away from that food. Maybe because it tasted the same, and I built it up in my head about right. Because people get excited about that. You get endorphins get released. Um, there's all sorts of rewards for going and eating that food, right? That's because Burger King is disgusting. It is. It, it is. But still, 15 years later, if I am standing outside of a Burger King, I mean, somebody might have to hold me back because of all the chemicals that they use to make it smell good in addition to taste good. Um, okay, other, so, so in reality here, food becomes energy, builds your new cells. So yes, it actually, physically you are what you eat. Um, anybody else? Cool, all right. We'll look at that safety thing in a moment. Um, let me stop the share of this. And I'm gonna head back to the internet. I got a little piece here uh, that I wanted to show from that slide about recalls. Uh, one of the fantastic things that we talk about is not, not food recalls, they're not fantastic, but would be our infrastructure, right? Which help keeps us safe from potential foodborne illnesses, sicknesses, disasters, and all sorts of things. So let me bring this page up and I will share this with you all. I do this, there was a time where this, um, in a, I don't know really how to say this. It's so weird. It's like there was a time a few years back when, can you see this? Is this sharing? Is that right? Yeah. Um, there was a time a few years back when this website was taken down for a bit of time. And I, it's not like it's, you know, conspiratorial or anything, but it was real weird because this information wasn't available for a while. Now it has been. All right. So let's just look. Hey, 420. Now, come on. How funny is it that the thing recalled on 420 was gummies? Come on. That's almost, that's, that's like a big setup right there. Uh, maybe that's not for real, but why did they recall it? May contain metallic mesh material. Oh, geez. Metallic mesh material. That does not sound good. Um, all right, so undeclared milk, potentially weakened plastic, undeclared. So there's allergens, product contaminated with Burkholderia contaminants, excuse me, undeclared. And then there's like undeclared anchovy. Uh, but that would, that would cause a really violent reaction in my dad who's allergic to fish. Um, undeclared almonds, undeclared milk, undeclared walnuts. Uh, Potential salmonella, uh, undeclared sildenafil. I do not know what that is, so I'm curious. Undeclared tadal, tadalfil. Somebody look that up, would you? There's a lot of that. There's three or four of those. Um, products contain an incomplete prescription, drug prescription. Uh, is anybody looking up sildenafil? Seems like it's in quite, maybe it's just a, Oh, these are dietary supplements for male sexual enhancement recalled. Oh, interesting. Okay, so you don't need to Google that. <laughs> That's, don't have to do that. Now, I think we figured that out. Um, wow, there's a lot of those. Okay, so this is weird. I have never seen that on this list uh, ever. Um, anyway, undeclared uh, salmonella, may contain, Pacific salmon burgers may contain small pieces of metal, um, potential salmonella. Uh, oh, what's this one that I saw here? Uh, uh, trace amounts of quipine fumarate. That's another drug. So anyway, um, when I ask the class, I'll have to check that out. Uh, so takeaway here is don't trust thumbs and mouths. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, pretty much. That is one of the takeaways. Water and water cons, real water, water and water. Hold on, water concentrate. All right, people. I just want you to know that this is this is full of stuff I've never seen. Con water concentrate. Is that an ice cube? <laughs> I tried to figure this out. Um. The hand sanitizer has microbial contamination. <laughs> so you actually are going to contaminate yourself by using the hand sanitizer. Okay, so let's just say, folks, infrastructure. Um, wow, yeah, have been contaminated hepatitis. Oh, goodness. Um, undeclared milk, listeria. Uh, because they, 
hand sanitizer because they resemble water bottles, the risk of ingestion. Oh my. Um, undisclared team. Okay, okay, good, 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 good. I'm gonna stop sharing this. This is um, it now, now that's interesting. I couldn't see all your faces because I really only get to see a, a few at a time, but I just wanna say interesting enough, right? Um, wow. So that's, that's really important. For especially for anybody that doesn't want any mesh in their gummies on 420, um, or just for a whole nother list of reasons like survival, these pieces here, right? I mean, metal might be the last thing if it might be something simple like a tree nut allergy uh, or something else. So good. Yeah, it's really important to see. And of course, we know the FDA, we know that it's a really, really, really important facet and component and institution. Um, that is, you know, largely needs more help to do what they're doing. Uh, but a lot of these things might not show up in other places. So again, as we kind of look at infrastructure. So when I ask the question, um, how concerned are you about the safety of your food? It was kind of typical. Uh, 13 for very, 11 not at all. So those are the ends and 48, everybody else being in the middle, right? But what are your concerns about food safety? Um, is it related to a personal allergy? And you don't have to tell us what that is, but is it related to that? Have you had a bad experience with food? Is it a food dating piece? If you are very concerned, um, I, mean, I can kind of see not at all. Maybe it's not a, a thing or a reality, but, but what about uh, if, if folks said very or somewhat, I guess I, I'm curious, what are your concerns about food safety? I think for me, it's just the amount of like unknown preservatives and chemicals that are in food these days that we just don't even realize. I like, I worked at Whole Foods and they like, I read like a big long list of like everything that they like don't allow in their foods. And it's crazy how much like a food I would have totally bought and has like this crazy chemical in it. So I think that's for me, like, um, I don't know, like, I just feel like it's changing our, you know, our composition with all these different chemicals and it's just, it feels so unsafe just because we don't know the long-term effects. Right. And of course, we're assuming the FDA is hoping, we're all thinking that in very small amounts, trace elements, right? A lot of the food that we eat has non-food ingredients. Like I said, I, I use chemical degreasers and cosmetics as an example because those are the, some of the things that have stood out to me. Anti-foaming agents, I mentioned that maybe this semester in regards, did I talk about the potato chip company in my hometown? Uh, in Freeport, Illinois, there is a potato chip company called Mrs. Mike's Potato Chips. I bet nobody has ever heard of that before, but they are awesome. And so my dad, I hadn't had any for like 10 years. My dad got me four or five big bags and had them ship it out. They shipped it out in a box that was the box that they get their anti-foaming agent in. And of course that gets shipped to the guy who's teaching environmental sociology who immediately is like, what is this? Takes me two seconds to look it up. Um, and and yeah, uh, I think the FDA had 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 banned it, had, had concerns about it, then had banned it. The guy was saying, you know, people, we tried something else. People won't eat our potato chips. We worry about it. Anyway, uh, long story short, that was years and years ago. It was eventually banned. They eventually had to stop. People still buy Mrs. Mike's chips. Um, and I actually knew the guy. My dad knew the guy. So I called him and I said, hey, do you know that you use this in your food? And could you use something different? And it started a dialogue. Now, they have to. So what's the purpose of the FDA and food infrastructure like this? Well, just because something is safe for a while doesn't mean that that's the case when we know everything about it. We wrapped an awful lot of pipes in asbestos. We made an awful lot of beaver pelt hats out of mercury and did a lot of other things with mercury before we realized that, you know, these were not things. Roundup, same thing. Um, so a lot of these things are still in our food. So perhaps um, you know, safety concern because there's a lot of non-food ingredients. You also brought up something else, which might be um, many of those things aren't labeled. And, and that goes for whatever. I buy almost exclusively organic food or local food. When I see natural flavors in that food, what? Right? So everything, I think, you know, I think it's important that 
that food companies have transparency. Um, and usually when we poll people before an election, like I said before, we've got 80 to 90% approval for labeling genetically modified foods, just more transparency and labeling across the board. All right, um, more concerned with monocrops as being more vulnerable to climate change, absolutely. Um, not planting, and we looked at that diversity of crops, right? Just getting smaller and smaller and smaller over the last hundred years. That also doesn't bode well when you're not rotating those um, because of what they pull specifically for each plant out of the soil and things like that. If it hasn't killed me yet, I'll keep eating it, honestly. It's good that you're honest about this. Um, it'd be ridiculous for me. Wait, so I said I've been eating it since storm, so 15 years, but that means I spent the first 32 years of my life eating pretty much whenever, whatever, you name it. Um, so yeah, no, no judgments cast here uh, uh, for any chapter of any kind, really. Um, unless it's white supremacy and then I would cast all sorts of judgments, you know. that. All right, uh, at least they're recycling. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, good. So some food safety, anybody has food safety concerns because you didn't know that something was in the food or unlabeled that you got allergic to or got sick from or anything like that. All right, well, we'll move on to the next question. All right, how much of your, how much of the food you eat do you grow? Did I ask that question? Um, how much of the food you eat do you grow? I did, and uh, all right, we had 71 responses. Out of the 71 responses, we have 43 for 0%. We have 25 for 1 to 15%, three people for 16 to 30, and maybe one person there for 31 to 50%. So uh, over half, 0%. So then that's the next question, right? And this is the next logical question, right? If you don't grow any of your food, who then do you expect to grow your food? Because mostly the expectation would be even if the next largest category, um, people, you know, 25 folks are growing from one to 15%, that's not gonna sustain you. And really, I have a four acre farm and I only grow 30% of the food that we use maybe. I guess, I guess that might be a quick estimate maybe a little bit more since we started slaughtering the chickens. Um, but, but we only did that once, twice, two years ago. So at this point, I would still say very little for me. So same question for me. So who does the class expect? Uh, farmers on large farms, 45 folks. Farmers on small farms, 17 people. Um, zero for neighbors, uh, two for a local CSA, and eight people will forage in the woods. I mean, at least at least you have a plan. Is that New Wanda? Uh, what's that, Dead Poets Society? Yep, so there's some people that are going out and putting mud on their face and for, or willing to forage. I mean, at the very least, you're willing to. Good, all right, let me go back here and screen share the uh, this and I'll get back to the lecture, back to the lecture at hand. Um, okay. So, wow, that's a picture when Storm was really young uh, at our last place. And we would, I don't know, we had one garden box, then we had five, then we had 10, then we had 15, then we moved to a farm because uh, we just didn't have much room left. We didn't have an HOA though, so it wasn't that. I would never buy a place with an HOA. That doesn't make any sense to me. Um, but early on, attempts here at growing and still as much of our food as possible. We don't do trays and trays and trays of this just to sell these plants. Uh, if we do a thousand plants and I only sell a hundred of them, I'm going to try and put everything else in the ground. Going to give it to people to put in the ground, going to try and feed as many people as possible. So we're just really doing the same thing now, but stepping it up um, to a larger space, really. This is Joel Salatin. We'll get to this uh, question next time. Um, but he was here uh last year no three years ago three years ago uh if you don't know who he is write it down joel salatin s-a-l-a-t-i-n he is with polyface farms and he not only you know goes all around the united states speaking to different colleges and lecturing on foods but he is really one of the pioneers of getting back to organic agriculture rotation rotating the chickens and then moving the chickens to another spot and then 
and, and, you know, processing these chickens. And then the USDA would show up and they'd say, why are you processing these chickens? And what are your parts per million of bacteria? And you can't do it outside. And he was getting, I don't know, two or three or 10 parts per million, something very small for bacteria. And it was, you know, a hundred times less than on the processing plants that they do inside where they freeze it with liquid nitrogen or ammonia and they wash it. But again, it's really, really hard to remove all that the larger the operation is. CAFOs and Greeley, the larger the operation is, the more chance you're gonna get for contamination and infection with whatever that is. So Joel Salatin, um, a really, really, really amazing individual. And, and there is one last thing that I wanted to watch this semester. I was kind of choosing between a couple things, maybe next week, one of the dates. Um, and I will not be here I believe next Tuesday or Thursday, I cannot remember. Uh, one of the dates next week, we will be watching something on your own um, instead of in class, but I couldn't avoid it. Um, just a really inconvenient travel moment. Uh, but anyway, so why don't we grow more of our own food? Question for you. And I know there's a lot of reasons because they're in college, right? Uh, but, but why, because some people might, why, why don't we collectively grow more of our own food? in your neighborhood. Why doesn't your neighborhood have a whole bunch of gardens in front instead of lawns? And maybe they do. Um, what would be your obstacles to growing food? Your parents' obstacles to growing food? What do you think? Why don't we grow more of our own food? Because food insecurity, right, is very, very, very related to how close we are to the food that's being grown. What do you think? And Parker, what do you mean by lack of proper resources? Um, like <clears throat> for some people, like if they're in an apartment complex, they might not have like the resource to like plant a garden. Um, also, some people's like backyards, like their soil isn't too good. And like then it would just become like a waste of like money and time, basically. Sure. Um, and of course, right, one of the ways we change that situation is to say, hey, let's make a proposal to the apartment complex. Or we did that early on over at Olander Elementary. We said, we'd like an organic garden. And the school said, write up a proposal. So we got together with a group of other parents. We wrote a proposal, they built it. And for the last seven or eight years, every day, at every class takes their scraps out to do composting. Every grade gets to grow a garden box with a bunch of different things. Um, but that wasn't there before. And it's not necessarily there now. Um, they really used to, there was a great group in town of individuals that I knew that I used to have come talk to my classes, my 220 class called the food school in Fort Collins. So they were going into schools, um, giving out plants, talking about sugar and what's in your food and ingredients and things like that. Um, let me go back up here. HOA, not everyone has land to have a garden in urban areas. Yep. Uh, it's hard, takes a lot of money to get started. It is hard. Growing food, growing plants is difficult. I wouldn't say it takes a lot of money um, to get started, depending on how resourceful you are, but it is hard to grow food. Back at home in Phoenix, growing season is really weird. Plants get extra crispy in the summer. You can hardly keep stuff alive. You can plant new stuff in the spring and fall. Shorter growing season, they get harder crops to develop. Yep, and for different reasons, uh, you know, folks that live up the canyon here or up in the mountains in different places, much different gardening at 8,000 feet. Um, than at 5,000 or sea level or whatever. Uh, convenient makes it easy for a society to choose grocery store. Oh, so convenient. Why don't we grow more of our own food? Because I can go to the store and get an apple right now, an organic one and an organic banana. And frankly, any just about anything else, right? Like, why would I do that? Um, so convenience. And of course, examining our relationship with food means that we have to look at that piece. Does that convenience help us? Does it hurt us? How can it be both? Um, you know, how can maybe the convenience of it or understanding of farming lead to more people growing their own food, which leads to more relationships with CSAs, right? Community shared agriculture bits. And I think uh, here in town, if I've not mentioned this, but I, I believe I have, Happy Hearts Farm um, is the very first or was the very first CSA, I believe, registered CSA in the United States. And that is on Elizabeth Street. So Dennis and Bailey, um, I think they finally, the, the farm now grows hemp, all hemp for Owl Canyon hemp or something like that, hemp company, but they did CSAs, they did veggies, they did food. 
for decades and decades, really dedicated people. Lack of knowledge in agriculture in my family and community. Yeah, definitely. Some people pass on that knowledge. Interesting. Um, you know, last year, Julie had eye surgery. And so she couldn't do all the planting that we're doing now on the transplanting of all the plants that we were selling from the farm stand because uh, she couldn't risk getting stuff in her eyes. So the boys took over and it was awesome. I mean, they planted our entire garden. They transplanted thousands of these tiny little plants and you've got to be super gentle and very careful and you transplant them and oh so loving. Um, so yeah, uh, maybe your family didn't do that. My family did. And now even much more than my own mom, which is where I, who I gardened with forever and my dad, um, the boys are really knowledgeable. So family, lack of knowledge and okay. Yep. Disconnection from food production, lack of caring. Um, yeah. Disconnection from food production for sure. And food production, like some jobs picking certain foods and, and food production because of the use of pesticides is very, very, very dangerous. Um, and so it would seem that only certain groups of people are doing this work, right? So uh, again, a bit of a disconnect. The only time a family grow outside seems to be chives, which she never used. Apple tree, and I only produce apple strawberries, produce small strawberries, and my dad is really going to start to grow a bunch of plants in our basement. Kale, okay, lettuce, tomatoes, wants to branch out. Awesome. So dad's doing an indoor garden with veggies. Cool. Um, a lot of food production is moving indoors. A lot of food production is moving vertical. Um, a lot of food production is moving into urban areas. Um, good. Uh, awesome. Yeah, these are these are excellent reasons. I, I like it when people participate and they talk, but I also love it when people participate just in general. So those are good. All right. So, I mean, one of the big things we look at as, as sociologists is how has the way that we produce food changed, right? Because if I'm like saying, oh, wow, let me tell you about this awesome, awesome new invention I have. It's amazing. It's, it's this piece of metal and it's kind of sharp and you drag it behind a horse, <laughs> right? People nowadays are gonna be like, um, what? Uh, but, but at the time, the steel plow allowed people to do so much more agriculture so much more farming, right? To be able to produce a lot more crops. So um, mechanical revolution, a good definition to know, just the substitution of capital for labor, right? As we start to get these big production pieces and, and mechanization changes it, right? The cotton gin, and I believe that's Eli Whitney, right? African-American um, inventor. Uh, threshing machine, steel plow, tractor. Um, and, and so we look at, how has we produced food? And then where is that food going from rural places to urban places? And then we look at this huge impact that capital and energy intensification has had, right? Um, on labor. It has really changed how we do farms. And now, it's only now really in the last handful of years that we're getting back to many, many, many small farming operations, whether those are organic farming operations, whether those are family farming operations, whether those are CSAs that are developed by people who are inspired to feed people, I, I think it's very, very hard. Um, but that has all changed only recently. For the most part, uh, and we'll talk about this treadmill of agriculture, just like we talk about the treadmill of pesticides, um, it, it changes. You need more money. And a tractor is $500,000. And when that tractor comes out and that's new, then that technology is really good for those farmers who can afford it or who can get into debt with it. But then more people get those, you need larger areas, you need to produce more, you need the newest piece of technology. Most farmers are in debt several hundred thousand dollars. I mean, the debt that is associated with farming and the economics that are associated with farming are very closely related to the high number of suicides that we look at in farming communities. And over the past two years, Suicides in farming communities and amongst farmers has taken a, uh, a drastic and unfortunate upturn. So much that um, government agencies have been publishing, you know, information about suicide prevention and distributing them in these places where uh, oftentimes they did not. That doesn't mean that people have been struggling as farmers forever, but it's getting harder and harder and harder to survive growing food. And of course, that is changing 
and intensifying as well, not just with capital and energy, but with climate change, right? Um, you know, the parameters are changing. Uh, the temperatures are changing. The amount of water and how, uh, is changing. So we've got to get smarter, you know? That doesn't mean that farming is done for. It means that people are doing it in smaller areas. They're doing it uh, in smarter ways. They're watering and, and using and wasting, excuse me, less water. So also we want to identify the structure of agriculture, right? So that would be how farms, rural populations, and agribusiness firms are arranged to produce and distribute food and fiber. Um, and again, you might have a lot of people making the food, but you do have control from companies like Sam's Club and things like that uh, with really, 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 really large profit margins um, that are impacting these farms and individual farms and, and not always in negative ways. Uh, like I said, um, I think uh, Sam's Club might sell some of the most or the most organics, uh, which is a positive thing. They use a lot of that money over the last couple of decades to try and dismantle and eat away and um, relax laws about organics at the same time. So, you know, yes, they're working with family farms. No, a lot of these family farms don't want to work with them. Yes, they've been successful at doing just that and having a relationship. Yes, organics is spreading. Um, but at the same time, so are these giant agribusiness firms, which are, you know, to a certain degree, based upon the method of production, choking out far small farmers in a lot of different ways. Um, so how do they get to produce? How do they actually get to distribute, which is a big piece, food and fiber? Um, and I know this seems old school, but tractor versus hand picking. This is where, and this is the other video, I'm going to choose between the two. Joel is kind of a weirdo, and I like the theme this semester of really brilliant geniuses that are freaks. So I might go with that. But if you've seen any of the awesome stuff that they're doing um, in Cuba with uh, urban agriculture, they're doing it without tractors. They're doing it without fuel. They're doing it in, in places that are run down. They're doing it by hand. They're doing it with animals so that the soil doesn't get tamped down as much. Um, and so there aren't some of the negative externalities that there are with these huge you know, tractors and, and um, machines and larger sort of farming operations. Of course, food transportation is a big deal. We have to look at how far are we transporting food? How much does that cost? What are the, what are the externalities? What is it in food? What is it in CO2 and you know things like that, right? So what does food transportation have to do with it? This is where I always thought we would see the big trouble occur, the big disconnect. Meaning this is where I thought when it comes down to it, it's going to be gas or a shortage of energy or fuel that would then lead to some kind of hiccup in um, food transportation and people being able to have access to that. Turns out this last year, there was a lot of externalities with COVID, um, but food transport's still a big deal. And certainly the structure of agriculture, and I've mentioned this now, how it's related to um, agribusiness. Okay. All right. So here we are, and I mentioned this, right? Number of commodities produced for sale, at least 1% of all Iowa farms, 1920 to 2020. I mean, this goes to 20, 2007, but in the last 13 years, I'm looking at this and I don't think there's been, maybe sheep or goats could, could be off the list, maybe, but we're already getting down there. So let's take a look at this and make some observations based on this. We're looking back a hundred years at what we used to produce, right? So number of commodities produced for sale in at least 1% of all Iowa farms. Um, all right, so what are we looking at here? Make some observations over time. Um, what do you think? Sorry, I gotta stand up. What do you notice here? Less diversity in crops. Yep, I think across the board, absolutely. Um, what's missing and why and what, what stands out to you? And go ahead and just click in if you can, instead of typing it, it'd be great. It seems that a lot of the products that we still see in stores like apricots and berries, watermelon aren't being grown here. So thinking back to transportation, like you're saying, I think a lot of those foods are mainly imported. And I know that's not just the case here, but I think that's kind of interesting. 
It is interesting. So, I mean, think of the, especially if we're importing from other countries, which many of these things we are now. Um, I mean, even tomatoes, especially in the winter, right? Uh, something that we think is easy. So a lot of these being imported, not just though from like Nebraska instead of Iowa, but from other countries. So our carbon footprint, how much fuel we're using, um, exponential at that point when you're talking about from a whole nother country. Good. What else? And chime in uh, verbally and then I'll eventually get over to the chat. It seems like we place more value in certain products that like today than we did then and that it's become more about profit through like production of corn than through having uh, these animals and these produces. Yeah, um, good, absolutely. Uh, and, and a lot of these are for profit. I think somebody else said less diversity. Good. What else do we notice about what we're doing now in 2007? Or <laughs> what we are doing now in 2021 as represented by 13 years ago? Yeah, right? Um, crops that feed livestock. So we went from, wow, you know, uh, popcorn and currants and tomatoes and apricots, sweet corn and gooseberry and turkeys and raspberries and peaches and uh, timothy and sheep and mules and pears and stripes. So, I mean, even the diversity of animals here, so much more diverse, but we've gone from that to very little diversity in animals. And most of it, if it's not animals here, then it's used being used to feed animals 99, 95, 93, 90%. Corn, soybeans, hay, hay, corn, there's three, and oats. Those are almost all uh, GMO and almost all used to feed animals. So a lot of resources being used of what's left to actually feed animals. It's interesting here to see in 2000 that chickens are off. My guess is chickens have made a comeback <laughs> and not just because I like chickens. Um, but yeah, ex exactly 13 years ago is when I started to hear about that when uh, Chickens were illegal in Fort Collins and people were doing backyard chickens and things like that. What else has changed here? I mean, this is, it's quite a bit. What, what implications do these changes have? What do you think? Health implications, social implications, what do you think? I think our society is definitely, it seems like you said, like a lot of meat, we're moving toward primarily animal products, it seems. It is a, a big movement towards animal products, at least in as far as what we're doing for ourselves. So large scale farming, uh, instead of smaller scale farming, more animals, I guess we could say almost exclusively animals and animal products, almost exclusively anyway. Ask my parents uh, what the different fields are in area growing. The answer is supposed to be animal feed corn. Yep. And a lot of that in Colorado, the last couple of years, um, you know, subsidies and giving farmers uh, money and planting. And around here, I was driving around miles and miles and miles of farmland where the corn was six feet high and then just all abandoned um, and all not picked, not going to animals, not going to anything. Um, people don't want uh, various farmers because diversity seems to be more expensive. All right, maybe we think of that as more expensive. Um, yeah, what's the trade off? What product is Timothy supposed to be in? It says Timothy. Is Timothy an herb? Somebody, you could look it up really quick. I'm not, I'm screen sharing this, so I can't. I, I think it's like sorghum. I think it's hay, like Timothy hay. Okay. For our horses. Oh, all right. Sorry. Yep. Um, I haven't heard it. I haven't heard that for a long time. Um, so what trade-off is poor soil after a while, more biodiversity equals healthier land. And we keep saying that over and over, not to be redundant, but it's an important theme when you're talking about a river, when you're talking about farming, when you're talking about food, when you're talking about humans, right? Um, the more diverse it is, the more biodiverse it is, the healthier the land, the less depleted the soil gets in predictable ways. 
Um, and thank you for looking that up. Absolutely. Um, one last thing before we move on that I'm looking at as far as the trade off what's a potential negative health externality from all this? What do you think? It was probably easier to eat a more diverse diet when all this stuff was grown near you. Yeah. Um, cheaper at least. Yeah, absolutely. Easier and more nutrients, right? So again, the egg that you get scientifically, physically, the egg that you would get from my coop overnight from a day ago would have more nutrients available than something that's two or three or four weeks old. So sure, lots of fruit and vegetables are picked early. And then they are shipped for long periods of time. Um, some of these things don't have a very long shelf life anyway. So really the externality uh, is, is more with, um, you know, fuel and things like that transportation than it might be with nutrients. But I think nutrient value is a big deal. It used to come from much closer to us, generally speaking. Good. Anything I was going to say, um, yeah, sorry, I feel me. like also when diversity has dropped so much, I feel like it makes it easier for huge factory farms and corporations to come in because there's not the competition of all these different industries competing anymore you know yeah absolutely and and with that you know every time somebody loses a family farm and sells that land you know and somebody else buys it as part of 500 acres or a thousand acres or ten thousand acres yeah we we have an idea of what kind of production that's going to be and where's that going to go so just the sheer number, and, and again, I guess I'd have to look because I feel like local farming and food production is making a resurgence. I, it, there are so many more farmers markets than there were even a decade ago. It just kind of fell off for a while from when I was a kid. So I'm like 70s through now. But when I was a kid, there were a lot of farmers markets. We went to many people around Freeport, Illinois, were growing all sorts of things. My mom went to one little farm that just had almost everything, berries and tomatoes and peppers and corn and sweet corn and, you know, all that um, available to us there. So I think, yeah, that's, that too has, has disappeared and then that getting passed on. But I also feel like making a comeback. So I, how statistically can we look at that? Maybe that's a challenge to anybody here. If anybody can find, and I'll try and do the same thing, anybody can find any kind of research, not now, but between now and Thursday, as far as what are we looking at for local farming operations, gaining traction, more of them, and this diversity of crops that we have seen disappear, where, where are we seeing that? How are we seeing that? Are we seeing it resurge in any meaningful way? Um, it would be great if it was. All right. Somebody actually took time to arrange their meat like that, although I'm not sure if that's supposed to be the United States up there. Anyway, um, so we do have a lot of food connected energy pieces. Average United States resident needs 2000 liters of oil equivalents to eat as we do, um, which accounts for about 19 or 20% of the total energy that we use. Solid and liquid animal waste. Um, in China, we have over 4 billion tons annually. Um, 4.1 times greater than the industrial waste there. Uh, and this, of course, for the most part, they're not disposing of animal waste. Animal waste is going straight into the ground and straight into groundwater, for the most part. Um, a conservative estimate would say 18% of our total greenhouse gas emissions up to 51%. We spend a lot of money on uh, food and agribusiness subsidies, right? And just like we do the same thing as far as energy, that isn't going to people who are trying to look for sustainable forms of energy, small types of things, new ideas, most of this is going. Small farms, small operations, research for organic farming, uh, not, that's not where most of the money is going. Most of this in the form of subsidies are going to very, very large landowners. And I guess we always have to look at that social justice piece, which is some people are literally eating mud cakes right? While other people are seeing their profits jump 200%. And in the midst of all of this, um, again, this is, looks like a good test question, but global demand for phosphorus increase, so that's fertilizer, right? Meat consumption, um, 50 has, has increased 50 to 100%. And I think, is it this one that I have? Nope, 
got it on another one. I'm gonna I'm gonna pause just after this particular one. But we're investing a lot of resources. Um, those resources that we're investing, we're wasting a lot of that. And if it does get to human beings, um, it's from a great distance away, not as nutrient filled and from larger operations with the less diversity of what we're getting. Feed cows cereal crops now, which is not their natural diets. They produce even more methane than they would grazing. And not only do the cows produce more methane, but they produce a lot more of the wrong type of bacteria, you know? And it's, it's, it's so on many different levels, what we're doing with cereal crops and grains, and we know that, you know, grass fed is like a really big deal. It shouldn't be. That's what those animals were meant to eat. Um, and just like human beings, we've changed dramatically in the past 50 years, what we eat and how we eat, and it has dramatically changed us. And the same is true with animals. Um, and when we look at feeding, um, feeding things to animals and, and that we wouldn't have, that they wouldn't have had, had access to otherwise. All right, good, good. Wow, covering a lot of ground today. Any questions, anybody about um, where we're headed? I'm gonna, I'll try and upload this after class. I've got to upload a video from yesterday. Uh, my internet was acting wonky out here because um, of the snow, I guess, because of the whiteout. We got like six, six inches at least out here. Uh, and now I can see the ground. And <sighs> now I can see the ground in some areas. Um, the next chest will be over chapters eight and 13. Eight is the chapter on food. 13 is the implications, the solutions chapter, kind of the wrap up of things that we've been talking about all semester long. Um, the GTAs are working diligently on the papers. So let's, uh, you know, they're working, they're working, they're working. I'm really, uh, yep, this week just eight. And I think we have three weeks left. We have this week. We have next week, which we're, we're not meeting once. And then we have the following week that is mostly exams. Maybe I, I, maybe I might be able to sneak in unless that third is a Tuesday. So we're getting down there. I will finish this chapter on Thursday. We will finish the implications next week. Um, and then maybe I'll come up next week. Like I said, one of those two videos that I think is awesome. You're not gonna have to write a discussion about it. You're not gonna have to write a paper on it. Um, but there's gotta be some element of something that I expose you to in this last sort of section. Um, I'll pick one of those two, because like I said, it's hard to, hard to decide because they're both really, really inspiring. Um, but I'll come up with that for you soon. No, uh, no more solution assignments. Um, any questions? No? Bulls probably had their best game of the season against the Celtics uh, last night. Uh, they've been doing pretty awful, but uh, played a solid one last night. So. Uh, I'll leave you with that and this, uh, oh, whoa, holy cow, this, now this, this is a big poultry. This one is huge. It's like, I don't even, it's like at least 12 inches tall and it's only, and we put them in the smaller two inch things so that their roots really get solid. You know, like you could put them and buy them. Sometimes they put them in the next level and then charge you more just for more dirt in a bigger container, but you want a lot of roots. So when you put them in the ground, they have a chance to really spread out, spread out and do what they're supposed to do. All right, be good people, do good things, mask up, peace to you, uh, be safe. And um, you know, you know more than I do, we're not out of the woods yet with this business, the metaphorical woods. So still be safe. I did get my first vaccination uh last week and i remember i told you i got tetanus a couple weeks before and then that messed up my the, the sort of more important life-threatening vaccination the tetanus vaccination was like nothing the first vaccination i got last week felt like some senior wailed on me when i was a freshman on my arm like about three out i did i got the shot at 7 30 in the morning went out and dug eight post holes for the garden with the auger but still did that tamped them in was like, this doesn't hurt. And uh, two hours later, I was just like, eh. So anyway, if you have a chance to do that, I think maybe they're turning Moby Arena into that. Um, I see Brennan has posted a picture of Jesus. I'm not sure why, uh, but, uh, oh no, wait, that's Obi-Wan, I'm sorry. Well, you know, from a certain point of view, peace everybody, take care. <laughs>